Hello everyone, and thank you for joining us for another installation of the Loden Sports Outlier Sessions. My name is Matt Pajak, co-founder of Loden Sports. Before we get started, a quick plug on what Loden Sports is. We are the affordable human performance data provider. We use non-exclusive objective athletic evaluations for the purposes of benchmarking athletic development, informing athlete health, and identifying outliers. Our evaluations are non-sport, gender, skill level, or age specific. They are for anyone and everyone, just like these outlier sessions. We pride ourselves on our experience and professionalism in executing evaluations and teaching others how to routinely evaluate. But most importantly, we pride ourselves on making historically difficult to understand performance data palatable for coaches, athletes, and parents. If you're interested in learning more or getting in touch, visit our website at www.loadinsports.com. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Loden Sports, and read our blog, which is also available through our website. I also want to throw a shout out to our friends at Yellow Box Macaroons, the first unofficial sponsor of the Loden Sports Outlier Sessions. If you're a fan of sweet treats, their hand curated coconut macaroons are a must. Continuing on the tradition of Jackie Weiss, Yellow Box Macaroons is the most delicious box of macaroons in the world. If you don't like coconut or macaroons, that's on you. Find your next box on www.yellowboxmacaroons.com or on Instagram at yellowboxmacaroons. The Outlier Sessions have been created as a way to bridge the gap and create a connection between the aspiring and the achieving. All of our guests have a niche at the highest levels of sport and are an outlier in their own right. We want to take some time to talk about long-term athlete development with them in the context of their experiences. We want to talk about their journeys, their processes for taking care of themselves, and get to know a little bit more about their personal interests as well. Now sit back and relax and enjoy another Outlier session, unless you're driving, in which case keep both hands on the steering wheel and your eyes on the road. All right, let's get into it. Our guest for this session is an old friend, first met at the Oakland Coliseum back in 2017 during a PDP event, he's been all over the place since, and is now a member of the Chicago Cubs organization. I'd like to introduce the first pitcher we've had on the show, Chase Watkins. Thanks for hopping on with us. Yeah, no problem, Matt. Um, excited to talk about some different variety of topics and uh, just kind of break down what's happened since since I met you back then. And well, that must have been like 2017, right? Yeah, 2017. Um, obviously, I've followed your journey every step of the way. Um, and it's fascinating, you know, obviously you being a West coast kid that decided to come East, um, at some point in your journey through college, you know, there aren't too many of you that, that come out East. So especially from NorCal, um, I feel like that's even more infrequent. It's a lot of, uh, you know, big West and impact 12. And, um, yeah, obviously that's where you started and you ended up, but in the in-between, um, obviously you had a lot of decisions to make. So, uh, looking forward to getting into all that. Uh, do you want to just start off by providing a little background on yourself? You know, kind of how old you are, where you're from, all that. I know I mentioned NorCal, um, but yeah. Yeah, um, so I'm 22 right now. I'm from Santa Cruz County, California, and uh, I'm with the Cubs organization. I got drafted in last year's draft uh, in the ninth round, and yeah, that's kind of where I'm at right now. I'm just training for the offseason, excited for the my first full my first spring training and my first full pro season. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, obviously MLB is in the middle of a lockout right now, but I think it's kind of poetic justice after uh, all the minor leaguers lost their season in 2020 to COVID uh, that the minor leaguers don't have to really deal with any interruption, um, <laughs> you know, coming into the, you know, obviously your first full pro season, but you know, for a lot of these guys, you know, last year was their first year back. Um, but anyway, we can get into pro ball and all those things later on. Um, but let's kick it off and start off with a handful of our signature LTAD-related questions about emotional well-being and ignition. Um, our LTAD will be an inclusive, holistic, and philosophical reference guide for developing athletes of all sports and levels of aspiration. In our eyes, everyone is an athlete. Yes, even the parents and the coaches listening uh, to this podcast. So involvement in sports translates in so many meaningful ways in our lives. Let's get it going with emotional well-being and the importance of gratefulness. There are little things we can do every day to bolster our emotional well-being. It's like a muscle needs to be trained. 
This is something that everyone can do every day. Chase, tell us three things that you're grateful for today. Say uh, my parents just being healthy and supporting me. Um, just being blessed with some good genetics to be able to play baseball, being tall, being left-handed. Um, and then another thing I would say is just the weather where I'm from. It's pretty beautiful here all the time. And uh, I'm close to the beach and the ocean, so. Those are three things off the top of my head. Yeah, I'm pretty close with uh, Guan Allen Hill Jr., who's also from Kansas, okay. and he's always sending me uh, pictures of the coast out there. So uh, <laughs> I know exactly what you're talking about. Uh, my first thing for today is also the weather. Uh, it flipped a bit today. It's up to like 43 here, and the sun's poking through. Yesterday was like 35 and rainy all day, which is just the absolute worst. Uh, yeah. So number two is a good set of instructions. Um, you know, when you have to put something together and you get like something that actually tells you what you need to do without having to do too much brain work. Um, appreciate that. And then number three is having a desk to work at, um, which is obviously super helpful for a number of reasons. But yeah, I think that's just a good way to, to kick off the, the podcast and, and kind of get rolling into things is with a little bit of the little things that we're grateful for. Yeah, definitely. So our second LTAD related question is a fun one. Let's talk about ignition. I don't know how familiar you are with it, but in our LTAD ignition is a key pillar to athlete development. It's kind of what lights the fire for the developing athlete to want to participate in sports. So uh, in your opinion, Chase, who or what in your life helped drive the interest in the sport of baseball for you when you were younger? Maybe talk about the people involved or if there was a specific moment that might've triggered it and kind of how it happened. Yeah, I honestly think it was really organic. Um, my parents both weren't really involved in baseball at all. They were super athletic though. And they both played D one sports, but they only like my dad played like little league and that was it. So, I think it almost helped that he wasn't super like, I have to play baseball. Um, but I would say the people that drove it the most were like my little league coaches and stuff like that, who like believed in me and kind of fostered that. Um, but from, from that point on, it was kind of pretty organic. I was just like throwing stuff from a young age. Um, and it wasn't really, uh, I didn't really have any crazy defining moments where I was like, I'm going to do this. Like, it was just fun. And then I just kept going. And uh, now I'm here, so. I can appreciate that. Um, yeah, it's kind of nice that, that no one was kind of like pushing it on you and you kind of self-discovered on your own that you wanted to keep going and pursue it, you know? Yeah, I mean, I definitely saw like a bunch of other kids have that backfire on them when they have like an authority figure in their life, like really pushing them to do it. And then you just kind of lose the love for it. And then like a lot of those kids aren't playing uh, baseball anymore because like it's easy for the adults to kind of take the joy out of it from a young age. And I was talking with one of my other buddies about how pro ball is almost like a full circle thing because of how much freedom you have compared to college and even high school in some senses. It's like we were talking about how it's like it's almost like we're back in like we're back when we were super young now, <laughs> except like everyone's just like really good now. But uh, I thought that was a funny way of looking at it. And it's definitely like a seesaw of like supporting your kids, but not uh, being overbearing. Yeah, I don't think it's just, you know, in baseball. I think it's in all youth sports right now where parents are a little yeah. bit overbearing in kind of projecting what they want from their kid by putting them in sports. And yeah, it, it, it leads to, to burnout. And that's something that in my grad work, a couple of years ago, I did some research on was, you know, there's the burnout from like a physical standpoint where there's overuse injuries and all that. But then there's like the psychological burnout where it's like as soon as a kid has a choice when it's no longer up to their parent, whether they sign up or not, like they're quitting sport, you know. And I think that's kind of why we have this question in here and why it's going to be a huge part of our long term athlete development philosophy as a whole is really just spreading the word on finding ways to ignite young athletes so that it's their interest and not necessarily the interest of the parent. 
Um, because I think that whether it's, you know, baseball or a sport or maybe it's art or music or whatever it may be, um, I think that's a key piece to emotional well-being and the whole nine in life is like having interests that are yours and uh, that drive you on a daily basis and on a weekly basis outside of, you know, whatever your job might be or whatever, you know, your obligations might be on a day to day. So, um, yeah, you kind of got to step into it on your own um, and make it feel like it's your idea. If, if you want to sustain the ignition, <laughs> I guess would be a way to like tie it back in because uh, it's just, it's going to get tiring if it doesn't feel like it's your, your own thing, you know? Yeah, exactly. So um, the final kind of LTAD related question, because this is another one that we kind of baked in. Uh, it's a foundational element. I want to talk about sleep. And yeah, I, I have absolutely no idea how you view sleep. So I kind of want to just open up the floor uh, in your opinion. In our opinion, sleep is of the utmost importance. Uh, it's actually a performance enhancer if you do it right. But um, how important is sleep in your opinion? And has your view on sleep changed at all over the years? Yeah, I think um, when I was in high school, I, it, like, I kind of figured out how important it was. And then I prioritized it. But then as I got older, it's kind of just like when you build a good habit, you know, you kind of forget about it and you just move on to like other things. So <laughs> it's definitely a foundational thing. And uh, obviously, like your body produces the growth hormone and there's a lot of like ways that you can enhance your performance by just getting a good night's sleep consistently. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty simple. But at the same time, I've learned to not be like neurotic about it and enjoy nights when you know, I'm having fun and I don't get much sleep. And like, that's part of life being able to like perform uh, when you have absolute like terrible sleep. Um, Cause it's like, are you even really training to the best of your ability if you can't have like one bad night of sleep and you just can't even function the next day. So I think almost like breaking your own rules every now and then um, is valuable as well. But yeah, I mean, sleep's a huge one and especially for the young athletes like developing. Yeah, I think you brought up a couple things there. Uh, one, the habit piece where you create a good habit and then you kind of forget about it. Um, <laughs> it. I mean, there's a ton of guys that you've played with every step of the way and you'll continue to play with that just don't prioritize sleep or have any idea how important sleep is. I think it's starting to come out a little bit more uh, like mainstream how important sleep is, but like there's still guys that just, you know, <laughs> they don't really think about it. And it's something obviously you said you caught on to in high school. Um, but I think it's kind of funny how you create good habits and you kind of, you know, um, it just becomes easy after a while. It becomes like ingrained almost. Uh, but the second part there was kind of where you said you don't become like too neurotic about, you know, if you have a, a poor night's sleep here and there because you stayed out late or whatever and kind of like missing out on like living or the opportunity that might present itself um, that's another part of our LTAD. It's called the golden mean. It's really about striking the balance between excess and deficit. Um, it's an Aristotle philosophy, believe it or not. But, um, I think that kind of ties in there too, where, you know, if you become like too mechanical, then like you're, you kind of lose your adaptability. If that makes sense. Yeah. Something I've been, uh, I had a really good conversation with a long time friend a few weeks ago was talking about like you don't really want your entire identity as a person to be the sport you play um because it's funny and this came up to me because i was looking at people who would in baseball this is super common like with all these new training facilities people like they end up retiring and they go tr they go become a trainer at driveline or wherever there's so many of them now and they start, they train athletes, but they also start training themselves again, but with like no pressure and like no expectations. And like all of a sudden they get off the mound after like six months and it's like the best they've ever been. And I was like, why do, why are all these people like making these huge gains when like the stakes aren't high anymore and there's no pressure. And I think like part of it can be like attributed to when you don't identify like your entire self as like being an athlete, like it takes a lot of pressure off you and 
to just like box all of life into that is I think doing a disservice to like your mental well being and like your athletic performance because you're putting so much weight on something that is just like a game in the end. Um and so I think that definitely like ties into to being able to not identify with your sport because like what basically if you don't perform right and then you get cut or whatever it's like do you just die then because all you are is uh x player like you're, you're just a baseball player and now you don't play baseball anymore so it's like that fear is in the back of your mind i think if you like if your whole life is just that um and i think that can hinder your performance with with some athletes i think it's a great conversation um this is a conversation that I've had multiple times with a number of different people because I'm seeing the same thing that you're seeing, but it's not necessarily, you know, like sometimes it's in the context of sports. Sometimes it's in the context of career. Like this is literally everywhere where like people identify with what their career is um, or they identify with, you know, like the you think about like any extreme like sports fan, right? So, you know, someone who's a diehard fan of the Kansas City Chiefs, and then the Kansas City Chiefs lose one game short of the Super Bowl, and like they go into a tailspin for the next week, and they can't pull themselves out of it because they've got this huge identity tied to something that they have no control over. Um, and to your point, like your baseball career is something that you have some control over, but like at some point, like it is out of your control. Same thing with your career or your job or whatever it may be. Um, I know that's something on my end that I've been very cognizant of you know, in the past five, six, seven years, whatever, like how I portray myself on social media is just kind of like whatever I want to portray myself on social media as in terms of like my interests and whatever, because the conversation I had with my friend, he's a baseball coach. uh, He's a hitting coach down in Texas. And he was like, there's people that have recently followed me that asked if this is like a, like a food account because I post a bunch of pictures of barbecue and I'm like, no, like I'm a baseball coach, but like, I'm not just a baseball coach, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think like I was even, so like in my Instagram bio, like the first thing it says is like, I'm a baseball player. (laughs) And I was like thinking about how, like, I don't know if that subconsciously is like ingraining that type of, you know, thing that I don't want. Cause I think it's definitely freeing to be able to, like you always perform best when you're like not even really thinking, right? Like if you go back to performance, you're not thinking about a whole lot and you're in that like flow state. And I think uh, the pressure that can come from like only like pinholing your identity can like disrupt that. So that's kind of interesting that you brought up like the social media presence and uh, cause everyone's like, Oh, you gotta keep, you gotta <laughs> keep your brand or whatever. And obviously if you're a baseball player, it's going to be only like baseball related stuff, but it's kind of interesting. Like we've seen, people kind of break off from that. Uh, like even sports players, like kind of posting about other stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really calculated because it's one of those things where you have to play the game, right? So if you're on social media, you like, you post a picture of yourself doing whatever you do, you write in your bio that you are what attached to whatever the, your picture is. And then you only tweet content about whatever, you're attaching your identity to, and that's how you get followers. And you find yourself in a world where if you don't do that, which is something that I don't, like I don't have like a concentrated following of people that follow me for certain content, you know? And like, I'm not gonna get that unless (laughs) I pigeonhole myself and how I present myself through my social media profile. And I'm not saying that's something that I wanna do, But what I'm saying is it's like, it's kind of funny when you look at it where it's like, I could easily like, you know, in a a snap of my fingers, like overhaul my social profile and then start tweeting once a day about the same thing and you would build a following. Um, And that's kind of the world we live in is, you know, how do you, (laughs) how do you create a, an audience, you know, Um, all the way down to kids, which I think is a completely different topic, but uh, that's yeah. 2022. <laughs> yeah, definitely. But, uh, let's actually get into some baseball. Um, I want to do a deep dive on your journey the past few years, starting with your senior year of high school. Cause 
honestly, what you've done the past couple of years is it kind of fits the whole theme of it being an outlier session. Um, you're a bit of an outlier in terms of how you went about your business through your college years. So, um, but back in high school, so one of our earlier guests, I brought him up, Glenn Allen Hill Jr. He passed on his senior year of basketball at Santa Cruz High School so as to properly prepare for a senior spring. You made a decision to play basketball your senior year at St. Francis High School where you finished as the second leading scorer all time. Was that a no-brainer or did you put some thought into the decision with your senior year of baseball coming up? Uh, I mean, given the season that we had the year before where we made it to the the California State Championship and like it was pretty crazy. I I never really it would feel like I was like like I owed it to like play that year. Like and I was obviously looking forward to it. So I never really thought about uh not playing that year. Um unless it was for like health reasons because I did actually I had a small surgery that uh like what would have been November I think. And so I missed a little bit of the year but I mean I never really uh was thinking about taking was skipping basketball because that was just really fun for me and I know like I'm never going to get that experience back so yeah I mean I thought it was awesome that you went out and you played something that I've come into or that's kind of come into my world a little bit and talking to like scouts out on the west coast is a lot of guys that do play basketball right before their draft spring is they're late coming out and obviously it's because out in California you know you guys play a whole lot more baseball than the rest of the country. So, you know, playing a winter sport actually does kind of set you back a little bit on your spring. Um, so during your senior spring, like, were you getting any draft looks? Did you have any thoughts about pursuing professional baseball straight out of high school? Or, you know, obviously you said it wasn't really a thought whether or not to play basketball. Um, did you kind of have pro ball in your realm at the time? Yeah, I talked to probably – like five or six teams um but more just like feeler calls i just uh i wasn't quite like where someone like where a lefty would need to be at least in my eyes like i think i was throwing a little bit too slow and still had like a lot of things to figure out so it was never like super serious um but i mean i talked to like a handful of teams uh but i never thought too much of it just because i i'm like a honest self-evaluator and i or I could understand that that was probably like not going to happen. And if it did happen, it wasn't going to be like the fit that I wanted regarding like financially and stuff like that. So. Sure. So fall 2018, you get on campus at Cal Poly and it looks like there's a path to innings as freshman. Uh, you end up throwing 36 innings, including nine starts. You kind of had some mixed results. And it was after that season that you asked yourself if you were in the right place for you. Correct. Yes. Um, so we, we talked about this in the past. I think it was actually, um, November, December, 2019. I want you to kind of walk us through the 2019 calendar year. Um, just kind of like talk about your frustrations and, you know, kind of how you prepared yourself to make a pretty big move. Yeah. So wait, did I call you when I was trying to figure out what I was going to do? Yeah. I remember you know, sitting at the USA baseball offices and uh, I talked to you for about an hour. Um, <laughs> and you kind of talked me through the whole thing. So if you want to give me like the, like the pared down version or however you want to, <laughs> you want to do it, but I've got, yeah. To, yeah. So I think it, if we can go back to like when I got on campus, this, this is pretty, this is pretty pertinent. So I, uh, I actually, it was like the second week I was in college and I was playing pickup basketball and I absolutely destroyed my ankle. I sprained it like ridiculously bad. Um, and I like didn't even pitch in the fall as a freshman. And so like that was a great first impression, right? And uh, and then I came back and I did like decently well in like the winter time, like preseason. Um, and like it was going fine. I mean, I was still like super naive to like what I needed to do to be my best self and best player. So. I didn't really know any better. And then, uh, yeah, the season came around. I pitched a little bit in the beginning. And then an opportunity arose because our Friday night starter had gotten hurt. And I had, like, just started to pitch, like, better out of the bullpen. 
like the week before that. And so they just slid me into that role instead of uh, like moving the rotation around. So that's when I made those nine starts. And I was, I mean, I held my own, but I was definitely like walking way too many people. And there's still a ton of stuff I needed to work on. But uh, that season ended and I got a lot of valuable experience. And then I went to driveline. I played with the Corvallis Knights before then. Like it was kind of coming together. I had a really good summer. Went to driveline, gained like five or six miles an hour. Um, and then I came back to campus. Like we had a new coach and there was kind of like some different things going on. And it was just like a clash with the stuff that I had found over the summer that I was like, wow, this is crazy. Like all I got to do is just have this consistent training routine and like stimulate my arm with like some underload overloads and like yada yada. And like, they kind of just weren't having that. So and this is funny because like now it's, it's crazy how much like the weighted ball stuff has changed since then. I mean, it exponentially, like, like the stuff that started happening in the end of uh, 2019 and the middle of 2020 with like the adapt, like the mass adoption. Cause I think it was still kind of stigma in a lot of programs just to like, Oh, look at that guy throwing colorful balls over there. Like, <laughs> right. like we need to go, like we need to go do our dynamic team warm up or whatever. But uh, so like back then it was still like kind of stigma and, and it just like, it was like I was doing my training stuff, but I could feel the coaches were like, it's almost like they're like rooting for me to fail. You know what I'm saying? They're like, well, we don't believe in this stuff. So we want you to do our stuff. And if you're going to do that stuff, like we're just going to like have bad vibes about it. <laughs> and so I was like, this isn't like the training environment that's going to like help me. I was throwing a lot slower as we were doing a ton of long distance running and stuff like that. Um, and I, like, I think I, when I was talking to you, I definitely like, I made attempts to uh, try to like, say like, just please like allow me to do this type of stuff. And I think they thought they were, but like, I didn't think they were. And you know, it was just a disconnect. So I was like, probably not gonna uh, like see my future here and like be able to be my best version of myself. So that's when I, you obviously couldn't transfer D1 to D1 back then. So I was looking for a JUCO. Um, and so I guess that that would have been like the end of 2019 when I like made the decision around Thanksgiving to tell them I was going to leave. And I had uh, already set up to go to the College of Central Florida, which was definitely probably like a head scratcher for a lot of people. But that place was awesome. So if you want to kind of do we want to get into that? Yeah, I mean, you went you went coast to coast. Cal Poly to College of Central Florida. That's like a full like 2,500 miles, three time zones, uh, a lot for a 20 year old kid, right? A uh, couple of big things I want to talk about in regards to this. A lot of people talk about change, but are afraid to actually do it. And you did it. <laughs> Was that a hard decision for you to make to relocate across the country? Uh, I don't think the country, so to speak, like the movement, the physical location was hard. It was the, the fully like the breakage of the Cal Poly like commitment basically. And like leaving there was definitely like really uh it was a tough decision in the moment and i was really torn because i didn't know what to do like i had a really good financial setup there and uh i liked the school and i liked a lot of other elements but in my heart i was like i just don't think it's right you know so once i made the decision though i definitely felt like a weight off my shoulders yeah and you know something that's so important to kids these days is having a division one school on their social profiles you've always been thoughtful and I think you had the advantage of being able to see the bigger picture. And I think a lot of what you've talked about up to this point has kind of fortified that, but nonetheless, was there any part of you that wondered if you were giving up something you weren't going to get back? Not really. I mean, I had, so I had like a irrational faith that I'd be able to like, like I knew my stuff was going to be good enough to get another offer from another school, like after a year. Cause I, I just, I was so happy to be able to just like, I've always kind of beat to my own drum. So like, obviously before I committed to college central Florida, coach Marty Smith, amazing Brett Merritt, who's now with the reds was the pitching coach. I talked to them like tirelessly. Um, and they were like, yes, like you'll be able to do your own thing. Like, and we'll like foster it. Like we'll like, we're literate in all this new stuff too. And I was like, dude, I'm like, it's a no brainer. Like I'm going to make gains here. Like I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to go like, play juco baseball which is like an experience in itself and if i didn't get to experience that like bro it's in some ways it's so much more fun than d1 baseball like because there's just so much 
everyone has their own unique story. And when you go to like a really talented Juco, um, where there's freedom for the players and they're treated like men, like it's, it's awesome experience. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, we talked to Enrique Bradfield probably about a month back now. And, and he talked about relocating from South Florida to, you know, obviously that Vanderbilt, you know, in Tennessee. Yeah. And he talked about how his sister kind of laid the groundwork for him to make a decision to leave South Florida for college. Cause I mean, he could have gone to Miami or he could have gone and there's a number of schools in Florida that probably, you know, expressed interest. I, like what was your time like in Florida and kind of, how did that, did that open up anything? I know you talk about like the difference between, you know, a D one and a Juco in that environment, but I, I'm assuming that was your first time living in Florida or being in Florida for an extended period of time. Like, do you feel like that from a personal side, like, how was that experience? Was that cool? Yeah, I mean, it was just kind of broadening my experiences and just, like, meeting a little bit of a different culture of people. Uh, definitely, like, enjoyed meeting a lot of those new teammates. Like, we had, I think we had, like, like three or four guys from, like, Venezuela. And obviously, I didn't really, you're not going to get that when you go to, like, some West Coast school normally. So, uh, right. all that was definitely fun. and. I was in an interesting area in Florida, so <laughs> there was some some unique experiences, uh, like the weather, obviously the humidity, just like being able to just you know see the country a little bit was like a cool part of it as well. Yeah, I always say Florida is like four different states. You got the Panhandle, which is more like deep south. You got like the Jacksonville area, which is almost like an extension of Georgia. Then you got you know like South Florida, which South Florida is its own animal, and then like the middle of Florida, what a lot of people don't realize it's a lot of like ranches and farms and, you know, yeah. a lot of open space. It's kind of country, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, uh, college of central Florida, you know, you talked about it a little bit in terms of, you know, the, the couple of things that made it a no brainer for you to choose there. Uh, and obviously there was a spot there available. Um, and for the people listening that aren't overly familiar, most notably, Nate Pearson, 2017 first-round pick of the Toronto Blue Jays. Um, but they've got a number of different guys across college baseball and across pro ball right now. Um, it's really become kind of one of those keystone JUCO programs where you know a lot of talent flows into. So um, College Central Florida, you had immediate success. And then like everyone else in 2020, uh, and it feels like everyone that we've talked to has been in a different uh, part of their journey when 2020 and the COVID season hit, like you lose most of your 2020 season. How quickly did your next opportunity come about to head back West? And was it in place before your spring season started at college of central Florida? Uh, to answer the second question, no, I, I didn't have anything in place before that started. Um, but I was lucky to end up like just lucky by chance that I was at a Florida Juco because I actually threw like I think I threw like 20 innings already and I'd made like five starts maybe six before it got shut down so I had a good like a good volume compared to most people um but yeah when it got shut down I was t I mean I was mainly talking to like ACC and a few SEC schools that were uh you know within a few states of Florida but then this must have been like it would have been like mid March, mid late March, coach Dorman, Rich Dorman, who was the pitching coach at Oregon State, uh had a connection with a Mariner scout, I think, who was watching me in Florida. And he was asking him about like left handed pitching, et cetera. And then he gave me a call and he had recruited me out of high school when he was at Grand Canyon University. So I knew him a little bit already, uh, previously. And then, uh, like, after meeting more of the coaching staff, uh, Mitch Canham, and I had already played that summer with the Corvallis Knights, who, if some of you guys don't know, they their home field is Oregon State's baseball field. So I, I'd already lived there. Um, and so it just kind of fell into my lap that that was, like, a pretty good fit, especially when, like, a lot of people weren't allowing visits at that time, um, that I had already had the experience there. And it's obviously, like, a premier program 
and like they were going to allow me to kind of do my own thing with like a super young coaching staff that is energetic and open to uh different philosophies yeah so all in all kind of it all paid off for you right like you you kind of you gambled on yourself you left cal poly you went to college of central florida it's nice when something's fall into place for you. Like I know the JUCOs are active right now and D one baseball is going to get started in another week and a half. Um, like it, it's kind of nice that you were able to get those innings in and that you had the interest. And then it's like, Oh, COVID season shut down for a lot of guys. When the COVID season shut down, if they were in high school, they didn't even play. Um, and for some of the D one guys, I mean, it was, you know, less than four weeks of baseball. So, um, yeah, D1 round two, you head back west, Oregon State, talked about that. Uh, you become part of a pretty good bullpen up there. You throw an inning and a no-hitter against Washington, uh, Fort Worth all-regional team. Did you feel a sense of pride or accomplishment after betting on yourself a few years back and then kind of it all coming full circle and having the year that you did at Oregon State um, and kind of having those different opportunities? Yeah, I don't think it quite – I mean, I think it probably hit me after I committed, but I don't know, after you sign and stuff, it's kind of like, that's when you do a little bit more reflecting because it's like the chapter is kind of fully closed now from like a college standpoint. Um, and so I would say more recently is when I've kind of done that reflecting on, uh, I actually visited Cal Poly too for the first time since I had left like a month or two ago and got to see some of my old friends. And like, it was, that was actually pretty crazy coming back then uh, just because it only been like two years, but it felt like so much stuff had happened in between. And, uh, yeah, I definitely was happy about that. And like, I can look back and be like, I, you know, had the courage to make a big decision that a lot of people want to make, but don't. And then they end up regretting later. So yeah, I'm really grateful for that. Yeah. Hats off to you, you know, obviously, and, and all of that. And we'll, we'll get into pro ball here in a second, but you know, just being able to, you know, go, Cal Poly, you know, obviously your eyes were open when you went to driveline for a summer um, and then ultimately making a really difficult decision and then, you know, being able to go out east, get an opportunity, come back out west, and then obviously, you know, I don't know, like, how cool is it to be part of that no-hitter against Washington? (laughs) It was fun. I didn't even know we had a no-hitter in the eight when I was throwing in the eighth inning. It's hilarious because there was a little like PFP come back into me with one of their fast guys. I don't think it was Braden Ward. No, there was actually two sick plays in that inning because leading off was was Braden Ward, who was like the fastest guy on the West Coast, and he hit like a chopper. Yeah, he hit like a chopper into the five and a half hole, and our shortstop uh, Andy Armstrong made like some sick ass play, and it was dope. But like the dugout was going like insane, and I like I didn't realize until later. Cause that like preserved the no hitter, obviously. Um, I didn't even realize until I was like, wow, I mean, it was a sick play, but like they're going crazy in there. <laughs> and I guess we were like five outs away. Um, so I didn't even realize until after, but that was definitely cool. I got like Oregon state made a, like a plaque. It's in my room here somewhere that has like, it's like a graphic of that. So that was definitely really fun. Cause that'll like live on forever. So that's so cool. Um, it's probably better that you didn't know what was going on. <laughs> Yeah, I literally didn't even know until like the, until I was in the dugout, and, and then they started talking about it. I was like, "What?" So after oh, yeah. your season ends, you head to the PBR Draft League, which was the first year of that league. Obviously, it was created with the MLB draft getting pushed back to coincide more with the All Star Game. Uh, what was that experience like for you? That was definitely interesting. I uh, I was coming off the regional high. I, pr- I probably peaked at you know, the last, that TCU regional for our season. And then uh, I took a little break and I wanted to get some more like longer outings, like some starts. That's why I went there. Um, And my velo was down a little bit and, you know, I was going through a few things, but it was definitely like cool. Like in the same way that Central Florida was cool, like meeting a bunch of different players and being in Pennsylvania for the first time in my life. Like I saw like three or four states I'd never seen before, West Virginia, Ohio, um, that type of stuff. So, yeah, that was fun, and I met a lot of cool people and connections that I'll still keep into this day from playing there for, you know, just a brief amount of time. But, uh, yeah, I definitely enjoyed that, and and it kind of gave me a good uh, 
groundwork to go into the draft and stuff with a little bit more looks, even though it might not have, I mean, it probably wasn't my best showing, but it happens. Yeah. I mean, baseball is kind of cool in that way where, you know, it takes you to places in this country and it, it makes you realize how big this country is, uh, first off, but it takes you to places in this country that you otherwise wouldn't go to, you know, like, you know, it's, it's not, your average person isn't seeking out West Virginia or, you know, certain corners of Ohio or, you know, for that matter, other parts of the country, minor league baseball will take you to. Um, so yeah, just, just kind of cool that, you know, you were able to have that opportunity and see some new places and, you know, obviously kind of fill your time and, and get some work in before the draft. Um, but on the subject of the draft, round nine, pick 274, Chicago Cubs take you off the board. You get straight to it in Arizona, uh, pro debut, 11 and a third innings, 20 punches, a solid debut overall. Um, you mentioned that your stuff was down a little bit at the draft league. You know, did your stuff tick back up? Because obviously the results were pretty good um, early on there. Yeah, it was a little bit better than it was at the draft league, but my velo was still down. Excuse me. <laughs> like, two miles an hour from college for I think I think just attributed to maybe you know you do kind of shut down after the draft and you kind of ramp back up but maybe it was just me being soft as well I don't know but uh I uh I think there's a different type of hitter in pro ball they swing more and stuff so I ended up walking a lot less people and and then like my secondary stuff I got a really good feel for so I was kind of like pitching a little bit more um when I was in pro ball and it's a really short sample size, but yeah, I mean, it, I, uh, I kind of was pitching a different way than I would have in college. Um, and it kind of helped, but there's definitely some stuff I'm focusing on going into the spring training that I want to kind of take care of from that, like that stuff standpoint. So. Sure. Uh, so on that note, what are your expectations for 2022? Do you have any idea what level you might start at this year? Um, I don't, but <laughs> sorry. <laughs> You're good. Uh, I'm just trying to like, you know, perform in spring training and then go from there. But I mean, I'm not really focused on that. I mean, I, I'm probably not gonna be a rookie ball. I could say that. So <laughs> yeah, you probably get the, the low A assignment and you go out there and you do your thing and you know, move your way up. Uh, yeah. Let's shift our focus a little bit, you know, off of baseball. And, well, I mean, kind of, but not really. But uh, to the topic of athleticism, you know, you talked about it. Your parents being athletes. I don't know if you want to go a little bit more into the weeds on that. But before you do that, how important, in your opinion, is athleticism for you on a baseball field? Yeah, I mean, I feel like being able to be have that coordination. To be able to, because you're never like, from the studies. If you look at it, your mechanics are never going to be the same on every pitch. So you're going to have slight variability in different movements, and then obviously fielding your position um, is going to require athleticism. So I feel like that kind of reflects in my training. Like if you ask any of my teammates, like I do a lot of weird stuff, and I can give you reasons why and stuff. And a lot of it goes back to just building a better athletic base. Um, <clears throat> whether that's mobility, flexibility, or like coordination. And so I think that's like a huge part that can go overlooked when like you're just hammering the big lifts and just listen to the metal and like you lose kind of the rhythm, which is like super important in pitching. Yeah. So you said it's a little bit weird, uh, but we definitely want to hear about it. So <laughs> what type of training are you doing? Um, I would say one thing that's kind of simple, like not to get too crazy is called, uh, Final hygiene and Dr. Tommy John, who's the son of the guy who like had the first surgery, kind of invented it, so to speak. And it's uh basically like you take your spine and every vertebrae through a series of movements, and essentially the reason why is because a lot of people don't like you kind of get stuck in training a lot of times and you neglect certain areas. And obviously, like, the spine is an essential area for a pitcher. Um, and so if you just look up, like, spinal hygiene, that's definitely one of the more weird things that I do <laughs> that you could find on, a, like, YouTube um, to give you an idea, kind of. 
Yeah, that's the first time I've ever heard of spinal hygiene. So definitely noted, and we'll dive into that a bit more. Um, so yeah, let's let's go back to your parents for a second because you said they were both athletes. Um, I don't know if you know what sports or you know where where they went for school or anything like that. But if you want to talk about that a little bit, shout out to the parents. Yeah. Um, so my dad, he, he kind of bounced around too, like me, <laughs> he went to Washington state, played football there. And then he went to San Jose state to finish out and play football. So he was definitely athletic and obviously a different sport, but, uh, definitely athletic. And, uh, they played middle linebacker. Had a, I think he had a year. We had quite a few interceptions and stuff. So, and then my mom was a swimmer who like has a few records in the state of Maryland and uh, she swam at Stanford. So some pretty good genetics that I was gifted with, uh, even though they didn't play baseball. Well, it's something my co-founder Sean always says, cause he scouted for 10 years. Uh, he said it, you know, if a lefty jogs out to the mound and doesn't trip over his shoelaces, uh, you know, when he's crossing the foul line, then, you know, he's, he's worth taking notes on. Uh, so, you know, you obviously have good size. You've got good genes from an athleticism standpoint. Uh, you kind of, you check a lot of the boxes when it comes to, you know, being a left-handed pitcher. There's fewer and fewer of those in the game right now that can actually go out and be competitive. Um, so obviously there's, there's a lot to like, and, uh, you know, shout out to your parents, obviously for passing along the genes more importantly shout out to your parents for you know raising you and, and putting you in the environments for you to explore and obviously make some really impactful decisions in your journey um but before we go let's talk about some personal interests if i remember correctly you've always kind of been forward and deep thinking you said that you, you kind of you row your own boat you fly your own flag i think you were the first one and I saw it probably on Twitter years ago to bring the idea of a standing desk onto my radar. Uh, and I also remember reading your blog back in high school. Do you still write at all? No, I don't really anymore. I kind of shifted like my whole mindset. I used to read a lot too. And I want to just like create more from a standpoint, like in reality, like not on a screen and uh, just take more action. So I kind of stopped doing that, but it was definitely like a good foundation to kind of just like mull over thoughts and like develop a game plan to of like what I want my like ethics to be and like how I want to go about accomplishing things. Um, but I think it's really easy to just like get stuck in like analysis by paralysis and always reading and like just being afraid to like take that leap. I think like reckless action in a way is definitely like an unlock for like getting stuff done and like becoming a better version of yourself. Yeah. It's just kind of like decide and do. Yeah. It's like, it, you can overcomplicate it. Just trying to find the, the perfect, you know, whatever. And it's like, you, you can't pitch like that and you can't really go through life like that because you're just, you're stagnant and you're, you're in a, like a catatonic state. You're caught off guard. You're not like, if you don't trust your intuition and just go, you're uh thinking about it a little too much so i've kind of moved away from that but the standing desk is definitely sitting sucks and sitting for long periods of time is even worse so i think the standing desk is a big thing but what's even better than a standing desk is like walking outside <laughs> but uh, i know people got to get work done and stuff like that so yeah i i hear you uh and that's another part going I hate to keep bringing it back to our LTAD but that's another thing where it's just like you know even I, I'm sure you're the the type of guy who believes in walking barefoot as well um, and all the benefits of you know feeling the ground with your feet as opposed to having you know shoes basically mute your haptic system um, yeah I think there's a, a place for both um, maybe if you have like a good like grass field I think the grounding thing is a lot more merit probably wouldn't do it on just like a sidewalk and stuff like that. Uh, but uh, I think, yeah, people get like pinholed into ideologies and it's cool to just be able to like try out different ones. And, and, uh, but I mean, going back to the outside inside thing, like it's, I was reading something apparently like 93% of 
people's time. I don't know what the sample and like where it was taken from, but it's like spent inside. And I was just like, damn, that's crazy. Cause so many of like the hormonal things that like make us healthy and function at a high level and then function at like an elite level for athletes are triggered by the sun and just like being outside and the different light spectrums. So I think it's crazy that like, that just kind of scares me that I don't want to end up spending that much time inside in my life. So it's kind of been on my mind. Yeah. And I don't want to enter a whole conversation about COVID. Uh, but I think when COVID hit and everyone kind of got locked down, it drove a lot of people inside. And I think that was a conversation I had with my grandpa multiple times over the course of when it was like, Hey, you can't really leave your house. You can't really go do whatever. It was always, I was outside. I was out for a walk. I was in the backyard. I was at the park. I was got to a, got to a point where they actually shut the park down and you weren't allowed to go to the park. Um, but I was always finding myself outside. Cause I was like, you know, when you're sick or when all of this is going on, like the worst place to be is where all the air is being recycled. You know, you, you gotta go, go breathe some fresh air, you know? Um, but yeah, definitely. What? So you mentioned creating in reality, right? And not digitally. Uh, what does that look like for you? Is that something that you want to share? Or... <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I'm trying to think of like specific. It's more just like being able to like, like you want to make the internet real, right? And so there's like these communities of people, and then like there's always like you have all these plans. Like you text your friends about, and like a lot of it never happens, right? Like it just stays in the the metaverse or whatever, so to speak. It never becomes like a real thing. So I think just leaning on the side of like creating stuff in reality more so to avoid. uh, I feel like everyone comes up with like a lot of great ideas and they never even make it out of like your phone screen or something. You know, does that kind of make sense a little bit? Yeah, everyone's got ideas. And I think this goes back to what you were saying before about like analysis by paralysis. You sit there, you come up with an idea and then you think about all the different ways that it's not going to work or how much work it's going to take or whatever. And you don't do it. And then it, to your point, like it just, it never sees the light of day. So like, do you, do you have like an example of something? That, yeah. yeah. Say like, like a random thing is like, so the other day, I uh, like we have a little bit of property here. I'm still in California. And I basically like, like we like planted some fruit trees, like just something as simple as that, like, and those trees are going to grow and like bear fruit in years. And they're like a physical representation of like something we wanted to do. Um, And so I think that is more valuable than, uh, than a lot of the stuff that is, you know, not essentially like in like the physical reality, it's just like on the internet and stuff like that. So I think, especially with the new age of just so much technology being available, like there's not a lot of people just doing random acts like that, just building something in reality. Like that's why I have a lot of respect for people. Like my dad's a contractor um, and like people that work in the trades and stuff. I think those people are extremely valuable. Like I have a new respect for like the people who build stuff in reality. Um, and I think it's extremely valuable. And I think we saw during that time how, like there's a, like these people, they work at these, you know, tech companies or whatever, and they do HR, they do all this stuff. And a lot of them can become like super high and mighty in their jobs. But like when we like break it down to like a base level, it's not even in reality, you know, it's all through like the internet and all that stuff. Um, so I know we're kind of going out in the weeds, but just like going out and just, you know, planting a tree or like getting your hands dirty and like fixing something like just building a fence, I think are super valuable acts, like especially in this town. No, I love it. And obviously you're so close to all of that being just what, just South of San Francisco, right? Yeah. I'm pretty close to Silicon Valley. So I see a lot of that. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, kind of the, the last thing that I want to hit on and, and I know you probably have something here, but you, you don't need to go too deep into it, but I just be curious, you know, any, any thoughts on crypto or NFTs? Cause obviously, you know, even, even though you're not as uh, you're trying to not think as much. You still are a forward thinker. Uh, that's not something you can really shed. But then, obviously, you just brought up the whole idea of creating in reality, which is awesome. And that kind of goes a little bit against 
<laughs> everything's going with crypto and NFT. So I'd just be curious, you know, what your thoughts are on that, if you have any, um, and then maybe how your thoughts have evolved. Maybe it's just in parallel with what you've already said. Yeah, I, uh, I that's really funny because it's definitely ironic. I mean, I think there's opportunities uh, for, you know, like making money and wealth. I don't quite know if it's like going to replace our current currency. And I don't really know if we would want that. Um, like a lot of people claim it's like, oh, it's decentralized, but it's still on the internet. Like it, it's still, uh, and it's still measured in dollars, which is really interesting. It's like, so if the dollar isn't around anymore, what do you measure it in? <laughs> and so, uh, I think that's pretty ironic that like some people think it's going to replace everything, but I think it's definitely, uh, ignorant to not try to understand it a little bit for people that don't. And that's why I've kind of taken the time to look into it a bit. And there's definitely, uh, some financial like benefits that, uh, if you make a few moves with crypto and a lot of people have seen those. Um, and I, I would just say like, just like anything, it's, there's a group of people I've seen it with like NFTs. Like they just like, it's this weird bitterness of not understanding it. And like, I'm not saying it's valuable and it's whatever, but there's like a group of people that they just like make fun of it because they don't understand it at all. And then I, th I think we saw that at the beginning of Bitcoin too. And then those people just look like idiots, like a few years later. Um, so just being able to be literate in it and attempt to learn a little bit about it before just uh, tossing it away and like making jokes about it is extremely valuable. Yeah, I think we can say whatever we want to about a picture of an ape selling for over $2 million or the equivalent in Ethereum. Um, but the reality is, is that the power of the blockchain and the technology itself and what an NFT can do can really streamline and make more efficient a lot of different industries out there. And yeah, I think most importantly, um, start giving a little bit more of the cut of the pie to the creators and not just the people at the top. So um, I think to your point, like, I don't know where it all goes in terms of, I don't, I don't foresee the US dollar or regular currency disappearing entirely. Um, but it'll be really interesting to see where it all goes in the next couple of years, because obviously it'll become more prominent and different things will die off and different things will come on and some of it will have staying power and all that. But I think to your point, NFT is a trigger for a lot of people. And I think the way that that ultimately goes mainstream is in a way where like those three letters aren't even mentioned and people are using the technology. You know what I mean? So like the people that yeah. you're saying are like, you know, making fun of the NFTs or like they're mad at it or whatever it is, like they're going to end up using it, but they're not going to know they're using it. Cause I think that's ultimately how almost all technology gets adopted you know? Yeah. I mean, I think you could really see similarities to that in, you know, Rap Soto and TrackMan at the beginning. It's like, <laughs> there's probably a lot of coaches that were like making the NFT claim. <laughs> they're like, this is just BS, blah, blah. And then <laughs> three years later, they're like showing a recruit like, yeah, this is our TrackMan. And it's just like, okay, okay, bud. <laughs> but uh, it's definitely like, it's a pattern you see in reality a lot if you're looking yeah, and then you and then you always have that small group of people on the backside of all of it that once things have gone mainstream and people have found value in, in how to use a rap soda or a track man, they're still fighting the good fight that that's not good for you and we should get rid of it. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, Chase, it's it's been about an hour. Uh, it had been way too long. Um, thanks for joining us. Best of luck this year. Can't wait to follow your first full year of Pro Ball. For those listening that want to keep up with Chase, give him a follow on Twitter at WatkinsChase22 or on Instagram at underscore Chase.Watkins. On behalf of Loden Sports, thanks for listening in, and we'll be back again soon. Thanks, Matt. That will do it for this episode of the Loden Sports Outlier Sessions. Thank you for tuning in, and we look forward to continuing to bring you the brightest and most engaging guests from within the Load and Sports Network. To stay on top of what or who is coming next, follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Load and Sports. Whether you enjoyed this episode on YouTube or Apple Podcasts, please like, comment, and subscribe. We'd love to hear from you. We'll see you next time.